بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وبارك We are in Surah Al-Luqman, Surah number 31, and Ayah number 31. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Al-Rajim, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Alam Tara, 31 is it? It's 20, Ayah number 20, sorry. أَلَمْ تَرَوْا أَنَّ اللَّهَ سَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَأَسْبَغَ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعَمَهُ ظَاهِرَةً وَبَعْطِنَةً وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يُجَادِلُ فِي اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ وَلَا هُدًا وَلَا كِتَابٍ مُنِينٍ After the advice of Luqman to his son, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws our attention to another universal reality and that is how Allah has facilitated life for human beings. The purpose of creation in light of the Quran and Sunnah is to help human beings worship Allah. The purpose of a human being's life is to worship Allah. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah says, I have not created the jinn and the ins, the jinn and man, except that they should worship me. So that is the purpose of a human being's life, that he must worship Allah. That's the goal and that's the objective and that's his mission. How does one do that? Then Allah knows that this is not possible in a vacuum. Human beings are going to be living in time and space. And whatever that is will require the heavens and the earth and the surroundings and the environment and everything else that comes along with it so that the human and the jinn may spend some time worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So although the ibadah per se is only a few hours, if that, Everything that you know, orbits around a human being's ibadah is part of the cosmos and part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's planning and uh, his design in order to facilitate that for the human being. This is the primary objective of such ayat in the Quran like this one, ayat number 20. Do you not see, O readers of the Qur'an, alam taro, do you not see that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has subjugated for you whatever is in the heavens and the earth. Subjugated is one translation, pick thought. says, we would say correctly, serviceable. That it is for your service that the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the heavens and the earth, everything on earth is created and designed in such a way that it provides you, O human beings, service. And on the back of that service, you have the ability to earn your living, live with the intention of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you must make a distinction between what is designed as an act of ibadah and what is designed as a tool Okay, and an Allah and a facilitator towards your ibadah. Earning a living is designed to help you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not worship itself. Okay. The, the, the common myth, unfortunately, especially in the 20th century, is has been and still is in many minds, is that your job is your ibadah. And we say no. Your job cannot be your ibadah because it is not designed to be an act of ibadah. It helps you eventually with your niyyah and your action to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's a difference. The difference is that any act that the Quran, Sunnah, and Sharia 
have uh, designated to be an act of ibadah is ibadah, meaning your salat, salam, zakat, and hajj. Right? Where the niya is going to be there as, as a requirement for that act. Any ancillary or auxiliary act will be rewarded, but not as an act of ibadah, but as a facilitator for your ibadah. So now you earning a living, and you then on the back of that money and wealth, mashallah, and your home, and your clothing and your food, you make wudu, and after your wudu you stand up for salat, then that salat is your ibadah. Everything that comes before it facilitates that. But that is a universal for everything that exists, not just man and jinn. Do non-Muslims also do the same thing until they don't make wudu? A non-Muslim will work just as hard as you, sometimes harder. Right? But will they make wudu and then do salat? So which act now is your ibadah? The fact that you earn a living or the fact that you stand in front of Allah and do your salat? So you, you must differentiate between the two. Otherwise you'll create a whole generation, three generations, four generations of people who are totally misguided about the dunya. Okay? Now, we're not saying don't work, we're saying work. But what is your objective of earning a living? Is it simply to feed your family, which definitely it is rewarding, you'll be rewarded when you bring food the table and you take care of your family, your wife, your children, your spouse, your, your mother and your father and, and your you know, grandchildren, brothers and sisters and the whole family, and that's why you are rewarded for that act. But that act in of itself you must not say is Islamic. Until when? Until you make the niya and you do your salat, salam, zakat and hajj. Is that clear? Yeah. So, when you go out into the community and you have a pitch and you say, we must treat our work as ibadah, then that's a free ticket to do what? Not to worship Allah, period. That's the danger and this is what happened. That people then said that being part of the dunya is an act of ibadah, therefore I will spend 20 hours in the dunya and maybe a few minutes in the act of ibadah, where I, I barely get my Jumu'ah in. I'll barely see the masjid once a week. Oh, boy, because I'm involved and preoccupied in another form of ibadah, which is not an ibadah. Right? Yeah. So here, the translation of Sakhara is very intriguing. We got all of these theories based on the correct translation of the ayat of the Qur'an and the words of the Qur'an where if you mistranslate it, it develops a misunderstanding which then develops an idea that is a total bid'ah in terms of the Qur'an and Sunnah. So the world view of uh, a Muslim through this surah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything as a means to service you. The sun rises to service you. The moon appears to service you. There is gravity on earth to service you. There is rain and there is the weather to service you. There are crops and there are animals to service you. Tasheer, sakhar, to subjugate. Subjugate, not necessarily physically, then it will be manipulation. But with the idea that we want you to pray five times a day. In order for us to facilitate that, we need everything in the cosmos in the heavens, on earth, and everything around you in order for you to come to terms with the idea that now I need to make wudu, stand up for prayer, now I need to fast, now I need to do zakat, now I need to go for hajj. This is Allah's facilitating ibadah for you. And it is only those moments in time and in your life when you are in ibadah that you're fulfilling your designated purpose of life. Everything else is auxiliary, because it may change with the Muslim and Muslim. It may change within the Muslims. If we all did what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do, then we would need how many masajid here in Illinois? 
to pray five times a day. How many would it need? We need about ten other Islamic foundations. We'll need another ten Dar es Salaam. We'll need another ten MSIs. Another ten Masjid Huda. Another ten Bridgeways. Why? Because you won't have the capacity to fill the Masjid with your limited capacity here. Why are Muslims with them? Doing what they're supposed to be doing. Ibadah. But if Muslims run around the world with this idea, I'm in Ibadah because I'm working 20 hours a day. No, you're not. That is a total misrepresentation of Islamic values. Are you rewarded if you have the niyyah to provide halal for you and your family? Yes. But it's not an act of Ibadah. Because ibadah means an act that is designed to worship Allah purely and simply. No other purpose can be served through salat. Right? No other purpose can be served through fasting. No other purpose can be served through zakat, other than some financial gain for some people. That's in your niyyah. And no other purpose definitely cannot be served through the hajj. That is your Islam. So this is how we see the uh, understanding we have of the certain ayat of the Qur'an upon which people have built uh, in the foundations of their uh, understanding of Islam. They must be corrected. And then he has now blessed you and spread out for you and loaded you. Isbaq. Isbaq means to totally... Uh, flood you in a good way that it, he has covered you totally with his blessings and bounties outwardly and inwardly outwardly and inwardly so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the human being hey look we have provided you with a physical body and all these uh, physical bounties in front of you outside of you which we just spoke of Inside of you, you have your your being, you know, your seeing, your hearing, your your breathing, your living, your 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 living, your tasting, everything that you do with your physical body. Then we have provided you with a number of uh, blessings that are now not just physical, but they're also metaphysical, intellectual, the noetic, and then spiritual. That's the, the, the metaphysical. And you must uh, look at these in our mat and blessings also as blessings from Allah. Your ability to hear, your ability to see, your ability to think and perceive and conceive and reflect and meditate, contemplate, and then to deduce and to intuit. Uh, your ability to dream, your ability to imagine, and your ability to understand what it is you need to understand. These are inner bounties that Allah says I have now loaded you with I have literally flooded you with these in our mouth. so think about them just as you think about your house, your car your investments, your children as ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala think of these abilities of yours also as ni'mah but you never spend time on those you spend time on all the physical in our mind. So now, when you are busy, what are you busy doing? Cleaning the garage, mowing the lawn, going shopping, taking care of the house, payments, this, this. That's what you mean when you say you're busy. What's another busy? You think about these in our mind. How do I perfect my seeing, my hearing, my thinking, my imagining, my ability to deduce and to conclude and my general understanding of who Allah is and who I am. So now it's one-sided. The inamat we strive for is always going to be one-sided. It has to do with the physical. Nobody cares to mention the inner, the bottom. So the Quran now brings this out into the open and is instructing us, Alam Taro. Don't you see? Meaning see. Observe. 
you must see the other bounties Allah has given you that glue you to the outer. So without the inner, you don't have the outer. If you can't see, hear, think, perceive, feel, taste, all of that, then you are nothing. The world becomes immaterial to you if you don't have your inner boundaries to reflect upon and think about and make shukur of and so on. Okay? Because the surah with Luqman's statements is about shukur, understanding how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you and what he has done for you and in you. And then you, you, you then give shukur and you give thanks and gratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you start telling your story. Okay? What is your story? That I'm made from nothing. And I become something. And who is the one who made you something? Allah. By which process or processes? This. That everything outside of me has been uh, given to me on a platter. Everything inside of me has been given to me on a platter. So what's my contribution? None. Except for the fact I wake up in the morning, go to work, come back home and sleep. That's my contribution to using, sometimes exploiting, other times manipulating all the inamat I have with me, outside of me, inside of me. So now this is a reminder from Allah. Alam taro. Don't you see? Meaning see. Observe. Think. The word ra also means to think and to perceive and to conceive and to understand and frame how your world view is. That my world view is not limited or myopic or is not going to be constrained by the, the, the values of society. Societal values will not dictate how I see myself. Because one of the greatest forms of ibadah is the dhikr of Allah. Right? One of the purposes for designing ibadah is what? That you remember Allah, and how do I remember Allah? I don't remember Allah by, you know, doing this, this and that. I remember Allah. By taking time out for myself and I'm there with Allah for those few moments in my life. So we all need basically a time out to think about ourselves. You talk about politics, you talk about economics, you talk about uh, the presidential race, you talk about uh, everything under the sun except you. What you don't think about or talk about is you. Not in the sense of your relationship with your spouse or your children or your parents or your friends or your teacher but in relation with you and Allah you never focus on you that is the batina the inner so when you have somebody who can show you how to focus on your inner ni'am and give some blessings then you should take advantage of that and do it it's much more enjoyable and thinking and thinking about what you already know. What you get on Discovery Channel. Right, what CNN tells you. Trust me, when you start to enjoy the inamat Allah has given inside of you, you don't need anything external. Because you have everything inside of you. And this what's inside of you will remain with you in your grave. What's outside of you, including your physical body, will decompose. It will cease to exist once you're in the grave. Finish. Khalas. So what are you going to carry to Allah? You're going to carry you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that uh, observe this, understand it, and then frame your life in such a way that you will be now in the state of continuous gratitude for whatever Allah has given you. Then Allah uh, alludes to a group of people within mankind who don't want you to do this because of freedom of speech and freedom of religion. And there are people from man, from mankind, who will argue about Allah, who will dispute about God, not based on knowledge, but without any knowledge, based on jahl. ولا هدى and neither no guidance ولا كتاب منير and also without any kind of guiding light enlightening book and revelation so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to all of us that when you want to talk about Allah in the sense that you want to worship Allah there are two reasons why you want to discuss Allah as a Muslim one is how to worship him 
and the other is how to be close to him with worship, through worship, and so on. If you don't have that, then you'll be arguing about Allah. Always disputing and challenging Allah. Always fighting Allah. So now, when your affiliation with Allah is now focused on you, you will be close to him. When your affiliation with Allah and about Allah is focused on others, then you argue. How so? That you'll see poverty in the world. And then a question will come to your mind. Why doesn't God feed everybody in the world? What kind of God is that? You jadu. You'll dispute. You'll argue. You'll debate. And you'll deny eventually. God, God can't be that way because he doesn't do this, this and that. And then the ultimate question, God forbid you're in a situation where there's no hope for you in your life or in your mind. Then you say, why me? Why is God doing this to me? So now, your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not for the sake of worshipping him. It's for the sake of questioning his lordship, his authority, his dominion, his power, his prerogatives. And quite simply his existence. Without any knowledge. You have no knowledge of who Allah is. Because you don't read the Quran. You don't read the Sunnah. You don't follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now you are debating. And as human beings, the Quran also testifies. We love to argue. We just love arguing. وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ أَكْثَرَ شَيْءٍ جَدَلًا and it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a sheikh, an alim, whether a murid or a student, whether you're a businessman, you're an engineer, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer, or whether you're the president or a presidential candidate, everybody loves to argue. Whether you're a sports analyst, whether you're a column writer, you love to argue. Jadal. Argumentation is part of the human being's DNA. Whether you're in a good relationship or a bad relationship, if you're not in a good, if you're if you're not arguing, then there's something wrong with your relationship. Why aren't you arguing? Why aren't you fighting? Right? The parent will argue with the child, and the child will argue with the parent, and life goes on. Allah is saying, don't argue about Allah. Don't make that mistake, because you're not God, and you'll never be God. So for that, you need guidance. You need hidayah. For that, you need Kitab Munir. You need a book that guides you, enlightens you, because only Allah can tell you about Him. Who's going to tell you about Allah? Your speculation won't do it. Your rationalism won't do it. Okay. Your, your understanding of the world won't do it. Your, your logic won't do it. Your intuition won't do it. Only Allah Himself will expose who He is to you through Wahi, through revelation, which is exposure. And that revelation comes through a Nabi and the Rasul. So Allah is saying that you have all of these great gifts that Allah has given you, zahiran, zahiratan wa batinatan, in the outer, in the inner realm of your existence. At the same time, make sure that you don't abuse your ability to, to talk and to debate in such a way that destroys you. Now, we do need the ability, the faculty to debate, and our ability to, 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 to have a process of argumentation. Jidal is part of the curriculum here at Darapas. We teach you how to argue. But, you must never argue about something that Allah doesn't want you to argue about. It's about worship, right? Mm -hmm. So, when you argue about worship, why do I do this? Why do you follow? What do you follow? The guidance. Whose guidance? The Prophet's guidance. So why are you arguing about? He says Maghrib at this time. So at that time. Why are you arguing about? Bighayr al Without any knowledge. Right. So what I'm saying, coming back to my original point, all the acts of ibadat are designed by wahi and by the divine. Okay. No speculative theory has been inserted into the acts of ibadat. They were ta'abudi. Meaning, they come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have no ability to rationalize these, nor do you have the ability to intuit, nor to conceive of any of these acts of ibadah. Who would give us the ability to conceive that maghrib has to be three rakats? Or you can sit down there for a hundred years and meditate? It's never going to happen. This comes directly from wahi. 
So why is Maghrib 3 and Fajr 2? No, we don't know. Right? Meaning, that there are certain aspects of Islam that are truly ibadah, and those that are ibadah, you cannot use logic in. You simply obey. And that is your shukr. That when you give up your rationality in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ibadah, which is the point of ibadah, the point of ibadah is to annihilate your being in front of the one whom you are worshipping. The abid has no existence in front of the ma'bud. That's when you do ibadah. Ibadah isn't when you conjecture and you speculate and you insert your own understanding and thinking, no, I think a woman should leave prayer because that's called equal opportunity. Hello? بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ وَلَا هُدًا وَلَا كِتَابٍ مُنِيرٍ Why? Because society says so. And when did society become your God? When did society tell you this is how you make wudu? And this is how you do salat? And this is when you fast and how you fast? And this is how you give zakat and when you give zakat? When did society tell you all of that? No, we don't know, but we don't care. Why? Because society demands that we have this. Now, you are doing what? Jidal. You're arguing about Allah. You're arguing against Allah. You are challenging Allah, and now you are denying His whole existence as your guide. Who guides you towards worship? Allah. No one else can guide you, because no one else knows what Allah wants from us. So the whole idea of subjective religious values doesn't hold any water in this construct. Right? Now, you will say, I have the freedom of choice, the freedom of expression, the freedom of religion. Glory to you. You may do all of that, but don't call it Islam. You can do all of that. You're free. But don't say that what you are thinking is Islam, because that's not Islam. That is a great disservice to the word Islam. Why? Because Muslims have never worshipped Allah this way. Never. And if a whole civilization that is, what, 1400 odd years old, mashallah, categorically denies this method and mode of worship, then what are you doing? That all of a sudden a revelation came to you? All of a sudden now you have Nabuwa? All of a sudden now you are the greatest gift to mankind? No. That's jidal. That's argumentation in the wrong way. So we must appropriate our intelligence and our thinking when it comes to matters of ibadah as being subject to the Prophet's now understanding of Allah's will. Not to our understanding. Because our understanding at best is very, very limited. So we, we see this now uh, as, as a point of uh, departure from what society wants to what Allah wants. Society wants you to do this, this, and that, and earn a living and be an honest citizen, that is fine. The issue of freedom of religion is that we must worship Allah the way Muhammad worshipped Allah, period. No other way. That's called the Sunnah. Why do we do this? Because that's what Allah wants. That's why we follow the Nabi and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we now submit our ni'mah of our understanding to Allah and to his Rasul. That Islam is a ni'mah. Islam is not a ni'mah. What is the greatest name Allah has given us? Islam. Right? Islam is the greatest ni'mah for all Muslims. You agree with me on this? Right? Otherwise there's no difference between you and Warren Buffett. Is that true? What makes you better than one Buffett? Your Islam. Whether you have a penny in your bank or whether you have a billion dollars in your bank. That is what separates you from him. Allah give him hidayah and tawfiq and make him a Muslim too, inshallah. Allah give him that ni'mah too. At the moment, you have an advantage. What is that? Yet you have the ability to actively submit to Allah and his Rasul. That is a great ni'mah. Your ability, willingness to submit to someone who is higher than you in authority, known as the divine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is a ni'mah. So when Muslims start to d- dispute the idea that we don't need to be submissive and we don't want to be passive, the Sahaba didn't see Islam as that. 
Because Sahaba had a choice. Either I say I'm a Muslim or I face persecution. Or I face death. Or I face torture. Or I face rejection from my own community. Who are they? The Muhajirun. Isn't that the Sirah? That in Makkah every Sahabi had a choice to do what? Either say he's Muslim or be beaten. Or be ignored at the very least. Now, we have the same choice. This choice is ni'mah. What is that ni'mah? That I willingly will submit to Allah and His Rasul, especially in matters of ibadah. Especially in matters of ibadah. Well, ibadah is not conceived by the ordinary human being. It comes through wahi to a nabi. And that is your ni'mah. That I have this ability to deny, reject, to debate. But I won't do so because I want to benefit from a higher ni'mah, which is my taslim, my Islam, my submission to Allah's will and to the prophetic model of worship. This is uh, the, the, the implication of ayat like these where Allah says, don't you see? Don't you think? Don't you observe? Don't you understand? This is how the cosmos work. They all work for you. They don't work against you. So we, we now see that uh, Muslims, when they are going to debate, we must debate. But you must debate for the truth, not against the truth. You have the ability to debate through your skill sets and whatever you've learned in your colleges, university, and your reading and critical thinking, whatever, your own observation of the world, that is wonderful. But you must use that ability to critique what? Go for You don't use that ability to critique Islam. That is counterproductive. Then you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're committing suicide, basically. Which is haram. Intellectual suicide. So yeah, we are smart people, alhamdulillah. Allah blessed the ummah with so much talent. So much talent in this room, subhanAllah. If you take everybody's now average intelligence, either, subhanAllah. It'll go beyond the ceiling. But that intelligence has to be used to defend the haq. Not to defend the batil. To defend... Allah and His Rasul and Islam, not to fight Allah and His Rasul and Islam. No, we need to be critical. No, 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 you don't need to be critical. You need to be faithful. You need to be loyal. Loyalty is much more valuable than your critique. That is what it takes to be a Muslim. That is your challenge. And that is your ni'mah, that you are doing this willingly. If you do this unwillingly, then it's a different issue. Alhamdulillah, as we say in America, it's a free country. You can choose to come here, you can choose to do something else. But you choose to come here, willingly. So nobody is uh, hopefully pointing a gun at your head. If anybody is that way, please don't come. I'm not responsible for that kind of violence. You are here willingly, because you want to be here, hopefully, right? You go for Jummah willingly. Do you go to Jummah because the community is going to now disown you if you don't go? There are hundreds of people who don't go for Jummah. You'll be another stat of the community. You do this willingly. Islam is always going to be willingly. Through your ikhtiyar, your own choice. And this is what this ayah is saying, that it is this isbahun ni'mah, okay, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has covered you in such a way that the, the, if, if you have uh, if you have a robe or a thobe that covers you more than it should, then it's called isbah, asbah. That's what it is. So Islam is a robe, is a garb. It should cover you more than you think it should cover you. It's bad. Right? Yeah. So this, this is the implication of this ayah through the tafasir of the ulama of the past is that we must consider each ni'mah at his level. They're, 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 they're in our on the physical level, that's all material and they're universal, meaning common to human beings and to animals and the plants and everything that exists out there in the world. We can't destroy that level of ni'mah because we are Muslim. No? I mean, we don't go out uh, polluting the world. Number one. We don't go out destroying the environment. Number three, we don't go out uh, destroying natural resources. These are, these, these are responsibility as human beings, not just as Muslims. As, respons- as responsible Muslims, we should also say this and state this, that we are here to protect the world and everything in the world. That's our first priority. Number two, 
that we will not go out destroying the ability of human beings to learn and to think right, at the level of education, base education and higher level of learning through academia. Number three, we will not destroy the ability of any human being to make a choice between what and who he worships. Right? Freedom of worship. But once you make that choice that you want to be a Muslim, then be loyal and faithful to the Islam of Muhammad wasallam, not to the Islam of contextual society. Then that's not Islam, that's a bid'ah, for which you will be punished. Whether in this world, in all the world, in this world, people reject you. In this world, people deny. In this world, people say, this is bid'ah, this is haram, you are not going to accept. In this world, you will be traumatized. In this world, you will be frustrated by people like us. This is not the truth. This is wrong. We don't stand for this. In this world, you will never be successful because that is the Prophet Wasallam's promise to this ummah, that this ummah will preserve its deen. Even though they may be few in number, but they will preserve the deen and the meaning of deen and the understanding of deen. Right. And fourthly, through the dua of the Prophet Wasallam, you will be rejected spiritually. مَنْ أَحْدَدَ فِي أَمْرِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسِ مِنْ فَهُوَ رَدٌ This is the dua of the Prophet ﷺ. Whoever invents and, invents and innovates a matter in our deen, in that pertains to ibadat, okay, he will be rejected. This is the Prophet's word. Meaning you are rejected because of the Prophet's word. You will never be accepted, period. رَدٌ And whatever the Prophet speaks is divine. It happens, and it happens all the time. Right? Now, in that construct, once you are rejected, then there's a counter-reaction of violence, which is what we're seeing in the world. If your statement creates more violence and more evil, then perhaps you may want to rethink what it is your statement is. Not at the political level, which we really can't control anymore, at least at the social level, and what we say on social media, and what we teach in our classrooms, and in our Quran circles, and in our hadith studies, we must teach what is the sunnah of Muhammad wasallam, and that is that we have been created to worship Allah, and the only way we can worship Allah is by following Muhammad wasallam. Very simple. You, you don't need to complicate it. Deen of Yusuf, deen is simple, it's easy understand and to also to execute this ayah speaks volumes to us today that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has covered us in his in amat in such a way that we don't need to look for any other ni'mah once we have the ni'mah of Islam this is your worldview and this should be your focus now if you want to um, put um, some more uh, you know some sugar coating onto this, that's fine. How do we say this to our children? You say it the way you say it. That's how you say it. As we mentioned in Luqman's advice to his child, you say the truth the way it is. You cannot associate partners with Allah, that is shirk. You say that way, what's going to happen? Nothing's going to happen. What's going to happen? They're going to say, okay, this is what my father and mother are saying. So we, we, we must not become too preoccupied with the reaction that we might receive from our children or from our uh, peers or others. You must think about your, your, you know, your, your future in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is not that simple to say, that one of the three questions will be asked in the grave. Uh, Allah make us all uh, okay, pass those uh, questions, inshallah, with flying colors. And what is Islam? One of the questions, what is Islam? Right. So in your mind, you have already preconceived your idea of Islam. And in, in the grave, when the angels are asking Mal Islam, which Islam are you going to say? Have you ever thought of that subjectively? If you say that Islam does not believe in this, or we don't believe in this as Muslims, then you are precluding uh, your ability to answer that question in your grave. Because if your Islam is now half what it should be, 
oh, there's an Islam for ibadah and the Islam for this, then you have ruined your chances of passing that exam. Right? If your understanding of Islam is distorted in this world, you will not be able to answer that question in the other world. It's that simple. You're going to carry over your knowledge and conscience there. So you better get your Islam right here. And the only Islam is the Islam of Muhammad sallallahu so That's what you need to prepare for first before you prepare for answers to society. That's your Islam. So now how do I do that? You follow the Quran Sunnah. It is that simple. Now, we have certain issues that do become debatable and certain issues that never become debatable. So you make a difference between, in your mind, this is debated by the Sahaba and the Tabin and the scholars and this has never been debated by anyone in Muslim history. Then you follow the Muslim Sanad. Okay? Your chain of authority back to the Prophet wasallam, which is an academic exercise. Okay? You don't make that or you don't do that exercise on social media. You do that in a classroom. Okay? You don't bring academic Islam into your emails or into your social media because that's ridiculous. Then you that. That's not, that's not even a drive-through service for Muslims. It's less than a drive-through service. You're saying that all Muslims can get Islam from emails. It doesn't work that way. You need to spend a few more hours of your week trying to do this. I hope. Rather than a, I need a quick fix. A quick fix is what you call heroin. Right? Or joint. That's your quick fix. And then when you have that, your brain is dead. Is that the quick fix of Islam you want in your lives? Through social media and an email? No. Go somewhere, learn for an hour, two hours. From your very, very precious and exhausting life. Mashallah. Find time. When instead of doing what you do, uh, criticize CNN for 10 hours of your week. Go somewhere for one hour of your week. And say, I want to learn the deen for the sake of Allah and His Rasul. Then you can say, okay, now I'm, I'm preparing for my examination of the question in the grave. Man Islam, what is Islam? Okay. The simple Islam is I follow this, the Islam of Muhammad. That is your answer. Because that will be the other question. Who is this person? Right? Muhammad in the grave. Who is this person? If you don't know him, you don't know him. Right. Do you recognize him here? No. You don't recognize him because you reject him. Everything he said and did it doesn't make sense to me anymore. I don't want to be like that Muhammad. I'm this Muhammad. No? In your mind, you have to get this ikhlas into your mind, your sincerity that I want to be with Allah and His Rasul in this world and also in the other world, which is another ni'amah. And as I said, you have so many layers of ni'amah from the bottom upwards until you get to the ni'mah of wahi which came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and all the other prophets who came before him. This is what these ayat very quickly uh, will go through inshallah. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلِهِ آبَانَ When it is said to them that they should follow whatever is revealed by Allah they say no but rather we will follow whatever we found our forefathers uh, community upon. Was it not that the devil was calling them, inviting them towards the punishment of the fire, of the flame? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that when you equate society with the truth, then that is the devil's work. That is the devil's work. Right? The shaitan comes into the human life through society and societal values that go unchecked. And unbridled, meaning they're not checked and bright, they're not checked against wahi, ma anzalullah. When you check society and societal values against wahi, for us, which is the Quran Sunnah, then you're okay. But if you don't check them, because people now say this is the truth, therefore it must be the truth. That is when the devil says, okay, I'm calling you towards the fire. That's all I'm after. And this is one uh, eye which we can speak of. Later on, the second ayat, ayat 22, is what uh, concerns us, and I just spoke of this today. 
ومن يسلم وجهه الى الله وهو محسن فقد استمسك بالعورة الوطة وإلى الله عاقبة الأمور whoever surrenders his face and uh, lowers his face meaning his countenance and his person and his niyyah and his intention towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he is a good person doing good for others then indeed he has grasped hold uh, he has firmly grasped the strong now handle the firm handle which will not break. So you need to grasp Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rope. And for that you need a handle. That handle is what we call Islam. And that is more my yuslim. Islam means you submit willingly to what Allah wants you to do. And that is the Islam of all the prophets alayhim salatu salam. The Islam of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our Islam now has now two components. One is you submit to Allah. And the other is you submit to the Rasul. Without submission to the Rasul, you have no Islam. So it's no longer that uh, overemphasized and overgeneralized understanding of Islam, which is submission to Allah. No, it is submission to Allah through Muhammad sallallahu That's how you submit to Allah in this ummah okay, until the day of judgment. So yeah, as I was saying, that the ni'ma of Islam is what's going to lead us towards a better future and inshallah towards Jannah and that is what Allah says Allah it is only towards Allah that you will be able to travel where aqibat al-umur towards Allah is the best of endings okay, the best of consequences and fates and destinations is towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is by following the path of Muhammad and that leads you to the grave and inshallah towards Right. We'll, we'll stop here today, inshallah. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah.